I always tell people, I hate it when the husband gets involved. <laughs> me too. <laughs> I do. All right. I mean, me too. Right. Right. <laughs> now it's my turn. I have to chime in now. <laughs> I'm not going to let my wife listen to this episode, okay? Oh, no. She just will not hear it. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I, okay, okay, I'm sorry. No, I should just said I hate it. But, like, <laughs> man, I'm just it like... It complicates I understand. it. I, it understand. We, I was going to say yeah. that. We complicate things yeah. sometimes, don't we? Yes, <laughs> yes. 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 And, in the, and in the end, the wife is going to win. So it's like, can you just stay out of it? <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh. oh, my God. We recently announced the winners of the July Zebra Review theme, The Colors of Your Country. Today, we get to talk with those winners to learn a little more about their award-winning pieces. Thank you, judges. Katie with Katie and Company Furniture Restorations, Lauren with Portland Rose Studio, Keegan with Lemon Drops Reclaimed, and Natalie with the Ray of Sunlight. You guys have a tough challenge of choosing only three winning pieces. We thank you for your hard work and dedication to this industry. We also want to thank our prize sponsors, really terrific group of companies and wonderful prizes, Shacto Interiors Milk Paint, D. Lawless Hardware, Surf Prep Sanding, and of course, Zebra Paintbrushes. Listeners, if you are able to check out these pieces while you listen to the podcast, they are featured on our podcast page for you to enjoy. Just go to thezebrablog.com and click on the podcast. Okay, let's learn and be inspired as we talk to the winners. We have Jen with Perfectly Imperfect Furniture winning first place, Caroline with Living on Saltwater taking second place, and Jenny with The Painted Cow Shop scoring third. Congratulations to all three of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, and thanks for having me. Well, this was a fun contest and a bit of a challenge. Well, I guess that depends on whether you like your country's colors. Definitely got some great entries and love the winning pieces. Okay, let's talk location and weather. Jen, you live in Wisconsin. How's your weather today? It is absolutely perfect. <laughs> um, oh. And I don't, I don't feel bad saying that. And I know I've said this before. <laughs> I, talk about, I talk about it on my stories all the time. So this time of year, we have the most beautiful, perfect weather. And it only lasts for a few months. Um, and so I feel like I can brag about it a little bit um, because we all know what comes in like three or four months from now. And then it's the long, yeah. dreaded deep freeze in Wisconsin. So, mm -hmm. um, I don't know. I think it's maybe, I think it's supposed to get up to 82 or something like that. I bet it's like 75 ish right now and sunny oh, and no wow. wind. It's, it's beautiful, man. Yeah. You definitely have reason to brag. <laughs> and as you said, you pay your dues in winter. So you know what? We have no issues with you touting that kind of weather. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's good, excellent. Good. <laughs> you definitely, you guys will not be jealous in, uh, well, last year, um, last year on Halloween, we were buried in snow. And so that's how oh, early oh, it man. can start. That's how early it can start. And honestly, um, this year it didn't start warming up until late May, early June. So winters are long. Man. Okay. Well, we are a little bit jealous though, just to be perfectly <laughs> honest. Okay. <laughs> that's okay. okay. That's Okay. <laughs> Well, now, have you guys enjoyed the summer despite the pandemic challenges? We have. I wish there was a little bit more that we were able to do because summertime is always, you know, having the kids at home, which obviously they've been home now since March. But um, it's just a time that we like to, you know, go and do and travel and do mm -hmm. our fun stuff. And we haven't been able to do that as much. But um, having the nice weather and just being able to be outside and taking our dogs on walks and going to the lake and stuff, that's been really nice. Yeah. Well, I'm glad you're able to, to enjoy that as well. Mm -hmm. well. Caroline, you don't live too far from where I am in Statesville, North Carolina. You are in, I believe, Cary. Yeah, I'm right down the road, um, just a couple of hours. So Cary's pretty close to Raleigh. Yeah, it's a suburb just kind of south of, of Raleigh. So now are you from North Carolina? I am originally from New Bern. Um, so that's kind of how I got my name. I kind of mm -hmm. grew up on the water and that's kind of how my Instagram name came to be living on saltwater. That's a cool name. I like that. It really stands out. And New Bern, is that close to Wilmington? It's a little bit north of Wilmington, about an hour and a half. Um, it's maybe about 30 minutes from Moorhead City, Atlantic mm -hmm. Beach area. Okay. Gotcha. So what's your weather like there in Cary? 
It is hot. Um, <laughs> it, the the summer here in North Carolina has been pretty evil. I feel like the the humidity is really high. You walk out and it just feels like a sauna. So I've been doing a lot of painting inside. I'm very envious of you, Jen, with your um, <laughs> your nice 80 degree weather right now. Yeah, I, know. Oh, I get that a lot. <laughs> Yeah, we ha I had a um, one of the kids left a paper bag on the front porch yesterday, on the swing, and so I grabbed it, and it was like, I was like, is this thing wet? I mean, it didn't crinkle. I mean, it, you know, a typical paper bag crinkles, but not a paper bag that's been sitting in the humidity in North Carolina. It was just unreal. Oh yeah. So I have to ask you, Caroline, did you guys feel the earthquake a few days ago? We didn't. We were heading out that morning to head to New Bern for a couple of days. And um, as we got in the car, you know, we saw the Facebook stories and everything about it. And I was like, well, where was I at eight? I didn't feel anything. Um, but I know people in Raleigh all feel it um, in Statesville. Oh, yeah. I mean, it was um, we felt it. Um, my wife and I noticed it. Um, I think I mentioned this at the last podcast as well. But we we felt it in the kitchen. Uh, before we'd headed off to church. And it was like, it was really weird because the wind, it was almost as if the wind was blowing the, like those straight line winds was blowing the house, you know, where you hear crackling and popping. And mm -hmm. and then I immediately looked out the window because I'm like, oh, you know, we're not supposed to get storms. And I looked out the window and it was sunny and then, like the trees were as still as could be. And we both were like, man, that's an earthquake. And so, yeah, it was like 5.1 on the scale, and the epicenter was up in Sparta, which is just northern North Carolina. So it was definitely felt in our area as well. So, but uh, it was wow. it was interesting. Glad there wasn't you know wasn't as more in, any more serious than what was. I think they had some damage up in up in uh, Sparta with some pipelines breaking and things falling off shelves and walls and stuff like that. But I don't believe anybody yeah. was injured. Yeah. I think I read on your account that you have a full-time job and it's not furniture refinishing. Am I correct in that? That's correct. I'm an accountant and CPA. Um, that's my full-time job. So uh, oh, this man. is my side hustle and, um, <laughs> you know, very different from being an accountant. Oh man, you're talking about spectrums. I mean, that, I mean, being a numbers person and crunching numbers and then going into creativity. Wow. That's, that's cool that you have talent in both of those spectrums. Yeah, it's really just, you know, kind of come together. I love DIY stuff. I did my entire kitchen in 20, I guess 2019 was last year. Yep, I finished, we, we renovated the whole kitchen. So um, I had kind of taken a break from other projects and kind of picked furniture back up at the beginning of 2020. So, Well, we're glad you did, for sure. So, well, Jenny, you are in New York? Western New York, actually, near about 80 miles from Niagara Falls. So when you hear people say New York, everyone thinks New York City, right? We're not. <laughs> <laughs> right. I know. <laughs> Listen, I got to say, I saw on your Instagram account, there's a really cool picture of two Adirondack chairs and a big old barn in the background. Is this your place? Yeah, that's my backyard. Oh, my word. Yes. <laughs> what a cool place that is. That is That was beautiful. Well, thank you. I think that's why when people say, oh, New York City, and they picture the buildings, and, and you see from my picture, I'm, I'm literally out in the country, okay, where, you know, there's farms, and it's just a little town, uh -huh. and and, uh, and there we are with our uh, with our, our uh, big old barn in the back <laughs> that you saw in that picture. That's that's my workshop. It's very, it's awesome to have that much storage. Yeah, yeah. for sure. And that's one of those uh, scenes that uh, if you're a painter would be a good spot to put up a canvas and just paint the scene. It was really, really pretty, very relaxing looking. It was very yes. I wish I got to sit there more often. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Well, at least you have that as an option. So what's your weather like there? It's, it's perfect. It's the perfect summer day. It's in the low 80s and it's just what you'd want it to be if you were, you know, out enjoying a summer. So it's perfect. We're glad that two of us on the podcast are really enjoying the weather. Caroline and I, yes. we'll, just, we'll just be envious of you, you two. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, well, let's talk winning pieces. And we'll start with Jenny. Jenny, you won third place with this really pretty washstand. Nice work, Jenny. Tell us all about it. Thank you. Um, I don't do many small pieces. So that was kind of odd that I was doing that. Most of the, my work is all with, with larger pieces. But that I picked up at a, an auction and I had I painted it red. I just, I love the pop of color red once in a while because I do so much white. 
And a friend at work asked if I had a croquet set and I'm like, I have everything at my house. And I'm like, of course I do. And when I pulled it out, I thought, why don't I stage it with these pieces before I give her my croquet set? And that's how the picture came about. It was just a, you know, just happened upon it at that moment. So now was this a piece that you had in storage or what's the story on that? When I picked it up at uh, an auction, just had it sitting around the shop. And I think I might have moved something and discovered it that day and just, you know, grabbed some uh, some uh, emperor silk from Ann Sloan and uh, painted it and uh, and then parked it in front of my smokehouse. That's a, an old building on our property is that, that stone house. And so once in a while, I use mm-hmm. it as my, my staging wall. And, and that's kind of how that came about. I wonder how old that uh, that stone a stone wall is there. It's actually the house is around 1840 from what I'm told mm. from the from the property. Mm, that's really pretty. Yeah, cool building. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I've um I've laid some stone as kind of a something we've done periodically around here. And I, I mean it's just so much fun. I, I just love um it's just expensive. You gotta buy those big uh pallets of stone and um you know it's not cheap to do, but it's it's fun to see these old walls, you know, and just to realize that somebody laid each one of those, you know, and the fact that the stone probably I, I would imagine is probably local, probably for your area. I would imagine it is because we're we're very um close to Lake Ontario. Okay, mm-hmm. so I'm sure that it was back in the day. And and I like that you said you had an appreciation for it because it's one of my favorite spots on the property because I know that what it was used for in the past. And I mm-hmm. I honor that and we take care of it. We just had that building shored up because the, uh, you know, the, the, the stone gets little cracks and, and, and whatnot yeah. in it. And so we just had that shored up this last year because we want to preserve it and take care of it for the next person. So. Yeah, it's really beautiful. The washstand itself, it's got some dark layers underneath it. And now is that what it was before? Did you do some dark wax? Like, how did you achieve that look? Um, I used um, I'm a glaze, the, uh, let's see, it was Valspar, uh, dark glaze uh-huh. or antiquing glaze. And I just kind of wiped that all over it and, and then some distressing afterwards. So I'm a fan of the, of the glaze. I like playing around with that. Well, it uh, certainly is very beautiful. Do you still have this piece or is it sold actually i kind of forgot that i had it (laughs) after i did the picture i put it in the barn and then and then when that came up i said oh my goodness what did i do with that and uh and so then it then i ended up posting it on my uh on my etsy site so you helped remind me i have so much furniture pieces it's insane that i i actually can lose things on the property that that happens it does it really does that says quite a bit about your space (laughs) It does. Well, that's definitely a showstopper, Jenny. Congratulations on winning third. Thank Share you. your Instagram account for our listeners. The Painted Cow Shop. And I'm on Etsy and um, Instagram and uh, Facebook as well. Excellent. Thank you. Well, Caroline, you took second place with your dresser. Very intricate work. Very unique. Tell us about it. So I saw some inspiration um, from another furniture artist who had done a stencil dresser. And then I had been looking at some stencil dressers that, you know, are sold at a nice um, furniture store online and was really inspired by that by the furniture artist to create this look. And um, I started looking for um, a dresser kind of with inset drawers. That was kind of a key thing for me um, to get this bone inlay look right. And I had purchased a, an oak dresser and then it just ended up not being the right one. And then I found this one and it was in excellent shape. I mean, for as old as that those dressers are, it was in immaculate shape. And I knew that that was the right one. And I kind of just started down the path um, and with the stencil and it really came together much easier than I thought it was going to. I just kind of let things flow. I really did not have a plan of how it was going to look at all. I just kind of let the stencil take me wherever it was going to go. Now, when you do a project like this with stenciling, uh, I assume you've got several different pieces of stencil. Is that correct? Yeah, I purchased um, kind of a stencil kit from Cutting Edge Stencil, and it had, I think, it's a large version, and it had, I think, six or seven um, different stencil pieces on it. I didn't end up using all of them um, in the, the total design, but I used, you know, probably at least four of them. 
So you were able to use all of them for this. I mean, you didn't have to step outside of the kit to produce this. Right. Yep. Everything came from the stencil kit. Okay. So my next question is, where do you start when you stencil? Do you start in the middle and the front? Do you start on the sides and work your way in? I mean, how does that work? I started with the drawers. I knew that I wanted to do like a solid line outline on each of the drawers. And there is a solid line outline stencil in the stencil mm -hmm. kit. So I started there because this was the first time I stenciled and I kind of wanted to get a good feel for the stencil. And it was an easy thing to do that if I messed up, I could mm -hmm. easily paint over just a line. And then from there, I knew I wanted to center the flowers over the hardware holes. And mm -hmm. so that was kind of my next step. And then kind of did the top after I did the drawers and then worked my way around to the sides. Is it a struggle to get bleed bleeding underneath the stencil? Is that is that a challenge? Um, I watched some videos and um, use this re repositionable spray adhesive to kind mm -hmm. of help keep the stencil tacked to the dresser, but it's not strong enough to pull up the base layer. And that mm. was really helpful for preventing, you know, massive amounts of bleed through and not a clean edge. So is this piece in your home? It's for sale right now. It hasn't sold yet, but um, I know it's going to take the right buyer, um, but it is for sale right now. It's, it's sitting in my house. I'm enjoying the view with it right now, uh, but it is for sale. <laughs> Well, now you have to let people know that it's uh, gone up in price because it won second place. <laughs> yes, it's award-winning dresser. So uh, I'll, I'm going to print out the, the Instagram pic um, and, and have it go with the, the dresser when it sells. <laughs> yeah. And on top of that, you were, as you know, you also won the Zebra Weekly pick because you got the most likes from it on the previous week. So you're just getting all kinds of attention with this piece. It has gotten a lot of attention, so um, but it was so fun to do, and I hope it really inspires somebody to do a stenciled piece in the future. Yeah, well, it's definitely rewarding, I'm sure, when you put that kind of work into it and see it all come together. Yes, it has been. Caroline, when you were doing the stencil, did you have help? Because I've only done stencil on furniture once, and the tape fell at one point, and I was using my forehead to hold the piece in place as I was painting. So I, <laughs> I said, I could not do this again without a helping hand. Did you have some help, or did you hold it the whole time? I didn't have any help. The spray adhesive, for the most part, did a great job. Like, I think the sides were the trickiest because I couldn't really, like, turn the dresser over and, like, help use gravity at that point. So there were some times where I had an elbow and you know stuff trying to hold it so but otherwise um the the spray adhesive did help kind of keep it up there fantastic Man, it's jenny, great jenny it's too bad you weren't doing a facebook live or something like that when you were doing your... <laughs> it was it was it was comical because i thought how do people do this it was my first and only try yeah the, the thing is, I can totally picture that too, because I've been in those situations too, where it's like, I just need an extra set of hands. So you'll use anything that you can. And usually it is your forehead. So <laughs> yeah. um, I have a question for Caroline too. How long did that take you? I think maybe from start to finish, like including like just, you know, some sanding, priming, base coat and stuff, maybe like three weeks. I did the stencil part a week and a half of it. Um, and that was mostly working like one or two full weekend days. And then the rest was at night, probably a good five hours at night. Um I was really trying to power through and get this done because I just wanted to get it done. Really stunning, Caroline. Congratulations. Share your Instagram account with our listeners. It is living on salt water. Jen won first place. Really love how you incorporated the flag into this piece and it's not out of place. It really works well. Tell us about it, Jen. Oh, thank you. Well, that wasn't my initial plan for that dresser at all. When I picked it up and got it home, I kind of looked over it and I loved the original hardware, the, the kind of art deco waterfall style that it was. So mm -hmm. my initial plan was to do like a navy blue or um, like a really dark, deep green, and then maybe keep some of the wood grain and keep the original hardware, blah, blah, blah. Um, but I can't remember how it happened, but I 
I have to give a, a shout out to my friend Summer at Pinewood Charm. I think I was doing Instagram stories and she messaged me and said that dresser would be perfect for a transfer. Then that's kind of what got the ball rolling for me. I had, I've only done two other transfer pieces, so I'm far from an expert when it comes to that, but they are fun to do. And after she said that, I, I was kind of like, you know, she's right. All of the the whole front of that dresser was flat, which makes it easier to do a transfer. And it was a small piece. And I thought, well, maybe I'll just do something fun. And so I went on the Redesign with Prima um, website and just looked through the transfers that they had available. And typically I'm drawn to more of the like floral ones or even like the geometric like boho style ones. Um, But Mm -hmm. nothing like nothing was speaking to me. And then I saw the American flag one and for whatever reason, and this honestly, this was before um, the zebra theme was announced um, that Mm -hmm. I ordered this. So it wasn't even, that wasn't even my reason, but for whatever reason, it just spoke to me. And I was like, you know, this is something totally different for me. I've never done, you know, kind of, I don't know, something like that. So I'm just going to give it a try. And um, my initial thought with that dresser was to do it white. So to do a, you know, white distressed and then put the flag transfer on the top. And again, I was chatting with Summer and she said, I think it would be really cute in navy blue. I see that like maybe in a little boy's room or something like that. So I totally, you know, I agreed with her and changed course and went navy and um, kind of staying true to who I am and what my work is. I knew I wanted to do something that was distressed and rustic looking. So, you know, I painted it navy blue, distressed it. And then also once I got the transfer on, I distressed that as well. So it just gave it more of that like worn, like old school Americana look. So the transfer wasn't, um, didn't have an old, the old look to it. I mean, it was, you distressed the transfer after you had it on. So that's what that look is. Well, it did have a little bit of that already. Um, you can tell mm-hmm. if you just look at the transfer itself, like on their website, it does have that worn look, but mm-hmm. I took it kind of a step further because for me, <laughs> I am so like impatient when it comes to, you know, lining things up perfectly. Like I have so much respect for you, Caroline, doing that stencil. Man, that's something I don't think I could ever do. I just I just don't know if I would have the patience for it. So even like something as simple <laughs> as lining up a transfer and really, they are pretty simple. I can't seem to ever get those perfect clean lines. But that works for me because that's that's kind of my style. And that's what I like. Mm-hmm. So and, and I think it worked for this dresser too. Now the transfer itself apparently has white on it. So the white that we're seeing is not, um, it's not coming from the dresser. And but it's it, it all works so well with it. Am I correct in that? Yep. So there's no white on the, there's no painted white on the dresser at all. The dresser, mm-hmm. if you took that transfer off, it would just be solid navy, navy blue. So is this piece in your home or is this in somebody else's house? It's in somebody else's. That one, that one Whoa. sold right away that I, you know, and I, I knew when I did it, I'm like, this is either going to be a big hit or a big miss. You know what I mean? I just, I, yeah. it was one of those pieces and um, luckily it was a big hit and yeah, it's, it sold right away. So I was very thankful for that. Do you know how they're using it? Are they, is it in a bedroom? Where's it located? Do you know? You know, I don't know. I I should have asked her that. I I know she, I, she's bought stuff from me before, and I know she has younger kids. I'm kind of assuming it might be in one of their bedrooms, but I can't say for sure. Wow, that's so cool. That's neat to to know. Thank that, you. Um, it's fun. It's fun when you do something really different and it gets snatched up quickly, isn't it? Yeah, it is. It was fun to do something different <laughs> and kind of step out of my comfort zone a little bit on that one. Well, congratulations on winning first place, Jen. Share your Instagram account with our listeners. Okay, so mine is um, Perfectly Imperfect Furniture, R-E-S. <laughs> it's it's weird. So it's <laughs> Perfectly Imperfect Furniture was taken, and my full name is Perfectly Imperfect Furniture Restoration. It would only let me do the R-E-S. So it's Perfectly Imperfect Furniture, R-E-S. <laughs> yeah. And I'm on, on Facebook, too. Yeah. No, I, I like your name. It's it's long, but it's very memorable. So yeah. it's, uh, I've never had a trouble remembering that. That's cool. Oh, good. Thank you. Support for this podcast is made possible by Zebra, makers of the high-end yet affordable line of application-specific paintbrushes. Do you know what makes our brushes so desirable? 
They feature small diameter filaments that are exclusively designed to pick up and release paint in a controlled flow, leaving your finish as smooth as, well, a baby's bottom. And on top of that, each brush is designed for specific applications in mind. We won't report you, however, if you use a brush designed for one application and another application. That just means you have had so much fun painting you can't stop. Seriously, we do hope you enjoy using Zebra paint brushes. We have designed them to be an extension of your hand so that every artful stroke of your hand leaves down the exact finish you desire. Enjoyable painting means enjoyable results. Well, it's time for our Zebra panel discussion. Our listeners really enjoy these segments as you all, our podcast guests, really get to take over the discussion. And it's as if you are sitting at a table together as friends discussing furniture refinishing over a cup of coffee or tea. Today, our topic is pricing your furniture pieces. This will resonate not just with newbies, but also those who have been refinishing for a while as pricing is huge. You have to price your pieces to sell, but you also have to price them so you can make a profit. So a bit of a challenge at times, I would imagine. Just a reminder, no rules here. Our goal is to have a great discussion on topic between the three of you. So what say you panel? Take it away. Okay. Well, I'll start. Um, I know that this has been a question that Honestly, I probably get a message about almost every day from, you know, a follower and it can range anywhere from, you know, how do you figure out how to price your pieces to like, how much would you pay for this or how much, you know, like how much would you buy this piece for like in order to refinish it? So it's such a common question for me. And the thing is, is that at least for me, there is so not an easy answer or a black and white answer. And I have yet to come up with a good answer for anybody that's asked me that question. So I feel like that's why it's a good topic to discuss. And the only thing that I can really come up with to tell people is that there's so many different factors that go into it. And I think one of the biggest factors is your market. And so I think you have to know your market. You know, for example, I live in a pretty rural area. Things aren't very expensive here. People don't pay, you know, big city prices for furniture here. So I feel like my pieces maybe are priced a little bit on the lower side, but if I were to price them higher, um, I probably wouldn't be able to sell them here. Um, so I think that's like the first thing that I tell people is to know your market and also know like the demand of your market. What are people in your area buying? What are they looking for? Things like that. And then, you know, of course, I feel like the biggest things that go into to pricing it are um, looking at how much you put into it. So of course, you're going to take how much you paid for the piece. But then there's so many little things that add up along the way, you know, all of your supplies and materials and that, but then also your time. And to me, your time isn't just the time that you're sitting there painting or sealing or whatever. It's, it's all the, all the other little, little time things that, that add up. I think I had talked about this a couple of weeks ago in my stories, you know, every time that you go to move that piece in and out of your shop or your garage, or you move that piece into your house or wherever your staging wall is to take pictures, then editing pictures. And I think there's just so many factors that go into it that there's, there's just no black and white answer to that. Do you guys know what I'm saying? I agree. I live in a metropolitan area. We I live right outside of the capital for North Carolina. And so it, it's, it's a much different market than what you've described for your home location. And I agree. It, it definitely, that is a huge factor. For me, I, I'm still kind of relatively new to selling furniture. And that was one of the things I think that I've struggled with. I've second guessed myself as I've started to sell furniture. Am I valuing my pieces en enough for the time and effort in them? And then sometimes things sell very quickly and some things sit. So it's it continues to be a guessing game. I talked about being an accountant. I I do look at um, you know all those supplies, sandpaper, paint, the poly, brushes, things like that, and you know try to equate those to how much would be used on a piece. And that as just a base cost in addition to the the price of the furniture and then try to value my time and then based off of also on like a specific design on on a piece is a is that design worth it 
for that piece of dresser, will I be able, or that piece of furniture, will I be able to get my return if I do this design or is it more cost effective to do a different design? And then you have that struggle with creativity versus the business side. And it, it can be, there is no right answer. It's, it's very gray and hard to decide sometimes. Yeah, for sure. I think I have to agree with both of you. And when you said about all the time that goes into it and, and do you figure all of, all of that as well? Like you said, the pictures, the moving it, the purchasing it, totally agree. And I also think that the rule is there's not a rule because mm-hmm. what, what price works in a, for one person is not going to work maybe for me. And I can't sell basically at all where I live because I am in a rural area also. And my pieces aren't going to sell for that, that kind of money here. So almost 95% of my business is all Etsy and it's almost all of it is custom pieces. So like I have all my pieces listed and then, and then people just order from that and tell me the color that they want. And my pricing is all done on small, medium, and large because I basically do China cabinets and buffets. So I have a set price, whatever finish they want, small, medium, large. I feel like McDonald's sometimes, you know, small, medium, large. And then, and then that's how I, and that's how I price it. But I've also noticed, and I'm in my second year and I noticed this at the beginning of, um, at the end of last year is that, um, I was able to raise my prices because I think uh, a demand, you know, like the supply and demand, I Mm -hmm. I noticed that maybe it's harder to get some of these pieces in some areas. And and now right now, because of COVID, a business has been even just un- unbelievable because everyone's working at their house, right? That, uh, right. That, that I actually raised my prices again. So I think you have to go with people are paying it and are willing to pay it. And you know that there's room to, you know, keep inching up. Then, then if that works for you, then you can do that also. So I, I don't like to say, well, d- you know, based, based on what somebody else is getting, I got to ask that price or they won't buy my stuff because I found that that rule doesn't apply. I love that idea of the small, medium, large. So do you ship your pieces then? Everything is, everything is shipped to mine. Yeah. I don't sell anything local, unfortunately. Oh, wow. I've really wanted to get into shipping. I do have an Etsy shop and have listed things there, you know, list them on multiple locations. You know, things have sold locally before they've sold on, on Etsy. What's the farthest that you've shipped something? Colorado. California, oh. Arizona. I do a lot in Texas and a lot in Wisconsin oh, and wow, some Florida cool. too. Yeah, everywhere. We, we kind of laugh about it. I need one of those little pins right on a, on a map because when I started, <laughs> when I started, I I didn't plan on it blowing up the way it did. I just thought I was going to paint a couple pieces in my spare time. I had no, because I work full time. I have no idea that that was going to happen. That's awesome. I, and I also um, noticed the same thing happened to me, Jenny, during COVID, like my, or, you know, during the, the height of it, I guess, is that pieces were just yeah. like, I, I would list it and it would be sold within, you know, 20 minutes. And I do think yeah. it was because people were at home, people were on their phones or yeah. computers more or whatever. And man, that was nice. I, <laughs> and it was nice that people were actually like shopping local and shopping small, you know, I just, I, it would mm-hmm. be great if it was like that all the time. We actually had that discussion today, my husband and I at lunch, because I told him about some, some orders I had gotten today. And I'm like, you need to jump in, buddy, because I need your help. Yes. <laughs> and yes. Uh, and I, I said, I, I want to stay with it because when COVID, you know, is, is passed and hopefully, please, I hope it is passed soon. But um, when it when it does, you know, then maybe things will slow down. But while it's why it's hot, I feel like you got to, you know, burn the flame at every possible end. Right. So. Yeah, grow when you can and and chase it when you can. Um, Because it, yeah, it could, I mean, that's the other thing too. I feel like a lot of like, since the big, like the big box stores were closed or you couldn't go there, they were looking to smaller shops too. So it was nice to take advantage of that. One other thing that I was going to say about pricing too, that both of you guys kind of mentioned is like how, like in the beginning, you just really weren't sure. And it was more of a guessing game and you couldn't really base it on what other people were doing. I, I definitely think it's something that it's, it's just something that kind of comes with time and that you're going to learn and you probably are going to way underprice a piece at some point and then you're, you know, way overprice a piece. And then you just kind of, you figure out what works for you. So that's another thing that I tell people who are newer at this is just like, you just kind of have to go with the flow. And even though I know that in the beginning, I'm sure I was way underpricing my pieces, but 
I'm okay with that because you know what? It helped me grow my business. And at that time, I was way less experienced than I am now. So um, in those early days when things were cheap and kind of going really quickly, it also helped me gain customers and clients and followers. And then as my um, work has gotten better and I've become more experienced, I feel more comfortable charging more. And I feel like clients also feel more comfortable paying more because they're like, okay, you know, kind of she knows what she's doing or, you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. So I think that's also something that just, it kind of just evolves with, with time. Yeah. You have that proven track record and, you know, Mm -hmm. people provide reviews um, and um, feedback on your work that other people can then use and as they're purchasing your stuff. Right. And I think with all three of us, we can agree that staging our items Mm -hmm. does take it up to a different level, you know, as someone scrolling through Etsy, you know, as if they were online dating, they see a picture and they stop and they want (laughs) to know more when it's staged. And I think that also elevated our prices too, I think with, with that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and as it should, you know, I, I was just, I was talking to my husband about this this morning too, because we're actually selling a, um, we're just selling a gas grill that we have because we got a new one and I was out there taking pictures of it to post on marketplace. And my husband's like making fun of me. He's like, Jen, you only need to take one picture. Uh, It's a grill. And I'm like, (laughs) yeah, but it's all about the picture because even on Facebook marketplace, when someone's scrolling through, if my grill is like all dingy and dirty and you know, just like whatever they might scroll on past it. But if it's nice and shiny and clean, it might be more desirable. And I feel like that's how it, you know, it is with furniture. It's like, you do have to present it in a way that's going to make someone stop. And with that though, that also kind of increases your price because I'm not just wheeling that piece out and snapping a picture and posting it. I'm wheeling it out and putting it in the perfect spot and putting it with the perfect props and waiting for the perfect lighting. And then, you know, taking the picture and then editing the picture. So all of that is also my time too. So I do think you have to factor that stuff in. Absolutely. Absolutely. I agree. Even the thing that I'm, you know, that I sell on marketplace, just like your grill, I take photos, like they're like my furniture. So you can, (laughs) I can get the value for them. The furniture makes or breaks it. I've had people reach out and say, if I refinish this, how much do you think I could get for it? And I, and I, my key is, I said, you need to take very good photos. You need to get good lighting and that will help your piece sell, Uh, you know, doing good quality work, but also having great pictures and showing that, you're you've took the time to refinish something and it, it's a quality product so you know follow through of your effort and quality on the actual piece all the way to the photo I think it helps make the best sale for sure I love that both of you said that about marketplace because when I listed a dog house recently I staged it with props and my husband thought I'd lost my mind and <laughs> it was a marketplace <laughs> and I was like See, it matters one. it matters <laughs> So, so that's really yes. funny. So I think it's embedded in us and we're, we know that it sells. It, it, it's the visual story. I've had people tell me that they, they saw something I stage and they'll say that reminded me of my grandma's house. And, and so that pulled them in and, and there you have it. It's, it's sold. Yep. Yeah, exactly. I've had people say that too. Like, I, you know, oh, I could see that in my house now. And it is true. It's like, if you, if I just took that picture, like in, in my driveway or something, you might not see the, the potential in it, I guess. So, and I get that, I get that question too, Caroline, where someone will send me a picture of their piece and say like, how much, how much should I list this for? Or how much would you sell this for? And, you know, again, there's no black or white answer to that, but I do think that's, a, and I've never suggested this to someone, but I will now is, you know, I think you really need to make sure you're staging it and taking really great pictures of it because you did put the work into it. So that's how you're going to get the most out of it. Absolutely. Now, are you all pleased with your profit margins? I'm going to go yes. I am. I mean, obviously, like who wouldn't like to make more, you know, but um, for the most part, I am. I feel like just like I said before, like looking back, um, I do think I priced way too low. So I'm, I'm happy where I'm at now. I feel like I'm getting paid for, for the quality work that I am doing. When I started, I thought I had to also not charge as much because I didn't pay as much because I, I had gotten such great deals on items. I don't know why I had that in my, in my mind, 
when I was pricing, I thought, well, I got this really cheap. It wouldn't be right mm-hmm. of me to, you know, to charge so much. And I actually was doing that in the beginning. And, and then I, I realized that wasn't good thinking and, uh, and started, you know, pricing accordingly. And, and, and then I know that what you put into it too, as far as prep, you know, I see some people will list something and I see the bleed through. And I know that, you know, I, as I'm working hard at my prep and taking the time and, and, and then, and then staging it, I know that the, the value is there and I know the workmanship and, and I'm proud of that. And I know when I'm sending it out there, that they're going to love it too. And so that makes me also feel that it's okay to, to have increased my prices when I feel it's warranted. Yeah, that is such a good point. I've done the same thing, Jenny. I like there's times when I've gotten a piece for free or ten dollars or whatever, but it's a super quality, great piece that I put a lot of work into. And I used to do the same thing, like, well, I'm just gonna list it for a hundred bucks because I got it for free. And it's like, yeah, but but everything I put into it was worth so much more than that. So I do think you have to take that into consideration for sure. And uh, another question that I was gonna ask you guys. Jenny, I know that you said that you do like almost all custom work, but do you guys charge more for custom than it, if it would be something that you just have yourself that you're going to sell? Do you want to go first, Carolyn? Or? I can go. My answer is really short. Um, I haven't done custom work yet, but I've thought about it. And, you know, it depends, I think, on what the client is looking for and if they're trying to like match a specific color or if you know they're just like I want a forest green or a black or something like that so I think that that's kind of how you I would go about um working with a custom piece and and pricing it out is what is all involved in the the design Mm -hmm. for me I do just one price and, and it's all inclusive. I feel, you know, I know when I first started, I used to say I'd upcharge 20% for, for a different technique, but, but now I think it, it just streamlines it. I say, this is the size of the piece and you pick the color and I send them my sample color, but then I also have people who want me to match a color, maybe, you know, a color chip that they go and purchase and, and, and I'll have them mail it to me or tell me so I can look at it in the store and then I'll try and closely match it by mixing my paints as close as I can get to the color. So, but mm-hmm. I've left myself enough room in there with my pricing that I can do that. Okay. Right. If that makes sense. Okay. Yeah. I, I need to so. check out your Etsy, Etsy shop, Jenny. I, I didn't even know that you guys, either one of you guys had Etsy. So I'm not, I'm not on there. I love your business model. I love it. So do you yeah. just have like inventory? So you'll post a picture of like an unfinished buffet and then someone can message you and say like, okay, so tell me how I like no, 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 I don't post it on unfinished. Cause, cause I feel like nobody, I can't even see that unfinished is, 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 is you know, the, most people can't visualize it. Yeah. Okay. So all of my pictures are of pieces that I've done previously. And then oh. they'll look at it and say, I like that size hutch, but I need it to, you know how that goes. I need it to be a different yes. color and I need it to be four inches smaller. Okay. So then I have an album that I have of buffets or hutches. And then I, I just forward them with, you know, these are my measurements. This is what I have in stock. You pick the color. So it's, it's oh. like that. So they visually see the piece finished, but then they also know they can have it in any color that they want. Right. So. Okay. Oh, I love that. And yes, I have I have pieces in inventory to pick from because I you know I try to gobble up everything from marketplace to auctions like everybody else. Yeah. Do you guys require full payment ahead of time, or do you require a deposit, or you know how does that work? What is y'all's model on that? Well, for me, I. Well, first of all, I've just recently started um, charging 20 to 30% more for custom work versus if it's a piece that I'm putting out and selling on my own. And it is it has been one of the best decisions I've ever made um, because I feel like when people take on custom work, um, there's just so much more that goes into it. There's, there's more stress because you're wanting it to turn out perfectly. You might have to buy um, different paint than you already have on hand or different materials. Um, plus, you're also taking time away from from your other work to to get this custom work done so it makes it I I know that there's been other artists that either don't do custom work or take less of custom work because they feel like it's almost like a drain on them like they don't get to the whole reason why they love doing this is their creative freedom and you know feels like an art and whatever but then when they take on the custom work it feels more like a dread and more like work so it raising the prices has actually made me feel much better about it. Number one. And number two, you know what? 
I should, but I don't require any sort of down payment. Um, again, I'm, I'm like your typical Wisconsin small town girl who doesn't lock her car doors and gets them broken into. Um, and also trust that everybody will do the right thing all the time. Um, and luckily I've never been burned. I have such amazing clients and people around me that it's, I've never been burned like knock on wood. Um, but everybody has always told me that you should either have a contract or you should require some sort of non-refundable um, payment before you, before you start the custom work. So I, I should really should take that advice. I'm also terrible about taking the money up front because then I feel the pressure of a time frame. So I usually just tell them, you know, when I'm, when I'm getting ready to, you know, start painting, sometimes I'll ask for the money. If it's not a color that I'm, I'm worried it's going to sell to somebody else, then I will get the money at that moment when I start adding the paint to it, not when I'm prepping it. And then if it's something that I know isn't, I mean, let's face it, white sells. So if they ask me for it in white, I don't ask for any money until I complete it. I send them a photo, they, I post it, and then they pay me. So I'm kind of loose. And I've only been burned once. And that was on a gray piece. And again, I posted in my shop. I know it'll sell. Um, was I agitated a little bit? Yeah, because I worked with her. But it's the one and only time I've been burned on a custom order. So I think I'll stay with my 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 way of doing it. I think it makes people feel more comfortable because, let's face it, mm -hmm. they don't know us. And they're giving us all that money and saying, here, I trust you. So this yeah. puts them at right. ease, I think. Yeah. And, you know, they don't see what we see. Like, I feel like in our head, we know that we're going to make it beautiful, but, you know, they don't necessarily know it. So then when it does come out beautiful, it's just like, oh my gosh. And then they're, ha they're happy to hand over the money for it. I did have a customer this week who, who the husband and wife couldn't agree. And so that was oh. funny. Like they were literally arguing over how the finish was going to be. And in the <laughs> end, the last phone call, the wife said to me, you know what, honey, I like what you do. Just go do your thing on it and let me see it when it's done. I know we'll love it. And I, I looked at oh. my husband and I went, oh my Lord, what if they don't? Oh, well, you know, so I did my thing. I sent her the picture. They loved it. They agreed on it. But it was funny that a husband and wife were debating on distressing or darkening and they just couldn't come to an agreement. So I was their deal breaker. <laughs> oh my gosh, that that's funny. so funny. I, yeah. I always tell people, I hate it when the husband gets involved. <laughs> Me <laughs> too. I do. All right. I mean, that's All right. Very <laughs> now it's my turn. I have to chime in now. <laughs> Sorry. I'm not going to let my wife listen to this episode, okay? Oh, no. She just will not hear it. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I, okay. Okay. I'm sorry. No, I should have said I hate it. But, like, <laughs> man, I'm just it like, I understand. It. Listen, I, it understand. I was going to say it. that we complicate things yeah. sometimes, don't yes. we? Yes. 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 And, in the, and in the end, the wife is going to win. So it's like, can you just stay out of it? <laughs> yes. <laughs> You know, maybe I need to do maybe I need to do a, a podcast with husbands and and Ooh. have you make sure your husbands are on the, husband? listening to the yeah. podcast. <laughs> yes, and so I can sort of hey, listen. This is what I've learned, and let me give you some advice. <laughs> uh, yeah, I know it's funny. My my husband helps me a lot, but he like he helps me now with like the moving and like stuff like that more. But in the beginning, he used to help me, or he tried to help me with choosing paint colors or choosing finishes. And man, that did not work you know because i was just like step, <laughs> step aside you know like let me do my thing and i think he's just kind of learned it so i feel like that's where i'm at with like with that's that's what i mean when i say like the wife is gonna win anyway so just let it go <laughs> <laughs> oh, i good. always refer to my husband on my facebook page as the angry mover he's my angry assistant because he's always having <laughs> oh to move God. everything and he always says why can't i paint something small like pots or dishes or something why <laughs> Why is it always the largest buffet? And and recently, mm -hmm. just the shortest old story, I bought some stuff at an auction. I didn't realize it was in the upstairs of a two-story house. And oh. they were the largest pieces you've ever seen. And he had to figure out how to get them down the stairs and around the car oh, and out no. to the truck. And that day, he was just... If I, I'm glad I wasn't around. Let's just say that. And uh, <laughs> he says, how do you do that? And I told him I got so excited about the purchase. I didn't ask any questions. And I just purchased, you know, so... <laughs> So he's my muscle. I'm sure you guys have the same. Yeah, the guys are the muscle, and uh, we're yes. just dragging mm -hmm. along with this crazy business. Yeah. It's crazy. Listen, mm -hmm. as long as you guys appreciate us, we're good, okay? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yes. We do very much, very much. Well, speaking of Jenny and buying things, I would imagine people in Hilton, if you're a furniture finisher, you're like, okay, I just need to go to Jenny's barn and buy 
are you yes. guys finding it hard to buy things? Like, is it harder to, to buy those pieces on the front end now? Is it much more competitively priced? I noticed prices have gone up. I, I've noticed it in our area, but for me, a lot of people can't move the larger pieces that I like I'm buying that don't fit in the back of an SUV. Um, so you need the truck and trailer. So that leaves more inventory. I feel like for me to snatch because I can move the big pieces and I can store the big pieces. So that's what well, that works to my advantage, not to my husband's. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. If I had that barn, I would have so much furniture. I'm very jealous of all of your storage yeah. <laughs> area because I have an SUV. Um, I do have access to a truck, but I mean, most of the time I my SUV and my boyfriend gets home and I'm like, surprise, we have something new to unload. <laughs> And I don't have that much storage area. I'm limited to my inventory that I can keep on hand to refinish. I totally get that. Yeah. Yeah. Same here. I'm totally jealous of all that storage. Totally jealous. I feel like the prices haven't really gone up too much here. I love going to thrift stores too. And I, I have noticed that certain thrift stores like are kind of upping their prices a little bit too. And I'm sure that's just because, um, you know, demand, demand is higher right now. So I'm just going to, you know, go with the flow. I do have a lot of um, customers tell me when they purchased that originally they had purchased, you know, furniture online and it didn't have the quality. So I, I feel that um, painted good furniture, you know, the solid stuff that we're that we're refinishing, um, it's, it's going to be around. I don't think it's like a short term thing. I feel like it has longevity because the quality is there and people appreciate it. From what I'm seeing, they really appreciate the solid wood structure. Yeah, I totally agree with that. Because even that, like the new furniture that you are seeing that, you know, you see in a furniture store online, like it's, it's expensive. It's, it's not cheap. Yep. It's expensive. And it's, it's not, the, it doesn't have the same quality. So I, I do think it's going to be something that's, that's here to stay. You know, I think what we're doing, even though it might change and evolve over time, as far as like styles and finishes and stuff like that. Um, I, I think that this business is, is here for the long run. When I first started, I didn't realize I was going to get sort of um, like in one like country, um, country farmhouse. I, that wasn't my intention. I, I kind of was all over the board. I didn't know what I was doing. And then it sort of became my niche to be the buffet and China cabinet lady. And uh, so that's how I ended up getting, you know, purchasing so many of them is because that's that's mostly what I sell. I can't sell a dresser for nothing. I might I've painted like three dressers and they sat around for you know several months. And I thought oh, dressers wow. are just it's not my thing. Yeah, but I can sell a buffet, you know, in, in a hot minute, but not a dresser. And so I have a friend who specializes in dressers and we both laugh about it. And uh, so I said, I guess I guess if that's my niche. Just stay in my lane and keep at it and, and do what works. So. I have been looking for a like for buffets to redo. Um, I have a friend that's requested, you know, a buffet, and for the life of me, cannot find a a good decent one at you know on marketplace or at a thrift store around here. It, when it, every time I find one, it gets gone before I can get to it. So I'm really envious that you have so many buffets up in your area. <laughs> Uh, yes. And they are plenty. What about auctions? Do you guys do auctions? Cause that's my thing is the auctions. Cause I don't have time to go looking for this stuff. I, I do most of it online. Do you ever do auctions? I haven't. Do you find decent prices there? I mean, do you feel like you have to pay more um, for those? I think that would, would be my hesitation. No, I feel like I get, I get better prices than marketplace again, okay. because it's, it's the being able to go in. I think you know, having the, a vehicle to pick it up. A lot of people might on an auction think I don't have the means to get it home. So you might want to, that's just, I think it's a great source of furniture is the auctions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I was going to ask both of you, do you, when people inquire about purchasing your furniture, do you have people that try to get a deal and reduce your price? And how do you respond to those inquiries? Um, I, not so much anymore, but in the beginning, yes, I think people say like, would you take blah, 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 or what's the lowest you can go? And I think they almost treated it like, like it was a Facebook marketplace purchase. Um, but I feel like as my business has grown and, you know, my, my photographs and everything look more professional, then there's less of that tendency to do that. Um, so I don't get that as much anymore, but when I do, I, I mean, 99% of the time I won't reduce the price. I'll just tell them that, you know, this is the price that it's at. And, um, if I ever, 
if I ever have a sale on this price, I'll I or on this piece, I'll post that sale. Or yeah, I I almost never go down on price. I don't go down on price either. And I know that's probably a whole another show, but I don't do um I don't do sales on my Etsy page either. Because then I always think, well, maybe there'll be people will be thinking, well, she's going to have a sale if it's around long enough. So. I just, I don't do sale either, but no, I don't have, I don't have people asking me for less either, but maybe it's because it's on Etsy and not marketplace. When I did on marketplace, mm-hmm. I would have people offer me half, like they were doing me a huge favor and I was like, thanks, but no mm-hmm. thanks, you know, <laughs> right. <laughs> Thank you. Right. <laughs> My husband will pick it up today for half price. Okay. No, thank you. Right. Right. <laughs> right. I have cash. I have cash in hand. Yeah. yeah. I was, I was going to say something else about that with marking pieces. Oh, I know what I was going to say. I feel like my prices are already like pretty reasonable for, for what they are and what I do. So I feel like if I have a piece that sits around for a long time and I mark it down a little bit and then I mark it down a little bit more, I get to the point where I'm like, I would rather keep this piece for myself. Like I'll find a place in my house for it or gift it to a family member or a friend or do like a giveaway. I've done like local giveaways on pieces where like then you can put it out there and try to, you know, get more engagement with with people like comment or like or share this and someone will win this piece. I would rather do that than sell it for such a low price that I feel like I'm just giving it away. Absolutely. That's great. Yeah, I agree cuz it, it kind of then like lowers your average, you know, I guess that's a bad, not a great way to put that. But I mean, you know, you're, you've worked so hard on, you know, building your brand and your quality and, and stuff. It's, it's not beneficial for, for the business to do that. I do give a discount to previous customers though. I don't know if you guys do that. Like, like I have like four people who have bought several items, both of them to, to do their homes. And, and so for them, I give them a little break because they're previous customers. I do do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't have like a set rule for that, but definitely I have um, some, a few very loyal customers that have bought several pieces. So it's like, you know, for that loyalty, I think it's worth a discount. Yeah. Yes. Wow. I mean, great panel discussion today on pricing your furniture pieces. You all are successful and that means you know how to price effectively. So we, it's just a huge special thank you to all three of you for joining us today. We want to say stay safe and stay well. Thanks for having us, Lane. Thank you. Thank you for having us. And I've had a wonderful time chatting. Great to know you ladies. Thank you. A quick shout out to our friend Katja with Katja Furniture. Several weeks ago, Katja asked if I would be on her podcast. At first, I was flattered. How cool to be on the Katja podcast. But then I thought, wait, it's video. (laughs) I normally get to hide behind the mic. I won't be able to do that this time. Well, needless to say, I did appear on her podcast. And for those of you who would like to hear it and see it, you can find it on Katja's YouTube channel. Type in the Katja podcast on YouTube. Katja is spelled K-A-C-H-A. And it's episode 28. Thanks again, Katja. You and Carlos are excellent at what you do. I had a really nice time chatting with you. As most of you know, each month we highlight a furniture refinishing artist on our blog and interview them on our podcast. This month of August, we are featuring Fabi Brown of Blush and Ivy Design. You can listen to Fabi's interview on episode 25 of our podcast and check out her work on thezebrablog.com. In the meantime, we wanted to continue the celebration of Fabi's accomplishments by having you hear from a few of her friends. This will be fun as this is a surprise for Fabi. Hi, this is Kate from Gently Loved Co. I wanted to say congratulations to Fabi from Blush and Ivy Design for being this month's Zebra August feature. You are an amazing artist, friend, and person, and an inspiration to myself and so many others. Congratulations, Fabi. Hi, y'all. This is Kate from the Yellow Wallpaper Company. I just wanted to say thank you to my friend, Fabi, for all the hard work and dedication that you put into making our reimagined painted furniture hashtag such a success. I feel so lucky to be on your team. Congratulations on your zebra feature this month. It's very well deserved. Bravo. Hi, it's Allison from Ace Rose for Designs. Um, I just wanted to congratulate Fabi on her August feature. Um, not only is she extremely talented in um, refinishing furniture and painting and transfers, she does it all, um, but she goes above and beyond to highlight 
other furniture refinishers of, you know, accounts of all sizes and just truly um, inspiring to all. So congratulations, Tabby. It's well-deserved and I can't wait to see what else you achieve. If you have a refinishing tip that you would like to share, send me an email at lane at enjoyzebra.com. Put refinishing tip in the subject line and describe the tip in the email. Today's refinishing tip comes from Donna with This Old Vintage. Hi, this is Donna from This Old Vintage. So I wanted to share a quick and simple tip that I find useful sometimes. I love doing subtle edge distressing on my furniture pieces. I think it just gives it a more authentic look. But when you're distressing on an edge, I found that sometimes a sanding pad can actually go beyond the area that you were intending to hit. So for more pinpoint distressing, I will actually break out one of those nail files or emery boards, maybe crack it in half depending on the size of the area that I want to hit. And that way I can get a more controlled distressing along those edges. And if your nails are anything like mine, you probably have a ton of them lying around unused. So hope that helps. Isn't it fun to use something that was intended for one purpose, but you find another use for it that makes a task much easier? Thanks for sharing your tip, Donna. Great tip. It's time for a new monthly contest theme for the Zebra Review. It's summer sunsets for the August theme. Entries are open until August 31st, 2020. Wow, even saying August makes me do a double take. Hard to believe we are on the tail end of summer, but it's not over yet. So let's continue celebrating summer by having you paint your entry piece in a color or colors from the summer sunsets. That means you have quite a few color choices in the hues of a sunset. Use the hashtag the zebra review and you'll have your piece before our judging panel as they will choose three winners. Great prizes await the winners from Mud Paint, D Lawless Hardware, surf prep sanding, and zebra paint brushes. All pieces refinished from January 2020 to August 31st, 2020 are eligible for entry. We have some exciting news here at Zebra. We are launching a new website on September 1st. We cannot wait for you to see it and enjoy it. We'll have much more to share about this website and its launch in the coming days, so stay tuned. We hope you enjoyed this episode of the Zebra Vlogs Before and After Furniture Refinishing Podcast. Today's episode is also featured on thezebrablog.com along with contact information for today's guest. Your comments and suggestions for future episodes are always welcome and we encourage you to share those by clicking on the podcast slide in our header at thezebrablog.com. That's zebra with an I blog.com. Thanks for listening. Stay safe and happy refinishing.